From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and yours are safe, sheltering in place in a protected, comfortable environment. And we look forward to you joining us back in the Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. Those who study history have heard for years about the Spanish Armada. They've heard about Admiral Nelson, his victories. And they'll remember the incredible victories of America in World War II, specifically in the battles of the Pacific. Many don't recognize that naval power has been a key to global power for many millennia. Our speaker today is an esteemed professor of history and archaeologist at Stanford University and a personal buddy. He's an incredible fellow of the Explorers Club. One of the reasons why he's esteemed is because he combines academic excellence with a feeling for the story side of history. And I can't think of a better spokesperson to talk to us about the significance of naval power in the ascent of the Roman Empire. So speaking with us today about how Rome conquered the Med and ultimately the known world two millennia ago, we're welcoming to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Patrick, welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Always a pleasure to be with you and the St. Francis Yacht Club again. I'm thrilled uh, to be able to share, sometimes out of personal experience, but more deeply out of history itself. And thank you for the kind words. Because I'm an archaeologist, I study the ancient world. And also, we archaeologists try to connect the ancient world to the present world. So uh, your uh, comments about naval powers through history were very relevant. And uh, while I am a professor, my professorship is not exactly at Stanford. It's at the Fromm and it's been other places. But I am someone who's been teaching at Stanford for 30 years now, as well as working for National Geographic, uh, both as expeditions expert, explorer, a keynote speaker, and so on. Uh, in, in any case, my work on the Phoenicians and their successors, the Carthaginians, is what we're going to look at today and how there was this dramatic transition in the Mediterranean away from Carthaginian sea power to the Romans. Somewhat surprising, but when we look at the details, uh, it becomes more clear. In the title, you see Mare Nostrum, which those of you who remember your Latin, no, that means our sea. And why that's important, because it wasn't always their sea, will uh, become uh, apparent uh, by the, the time uh, we wind this up. How Rome conquered the Mediterranean and then the world. It wasn't going to be easy and it wasn't going to be obvious. We start about the third century BC, around 264, and we continue on. Uh, right through the establishment of the Roman Empire. So when we look at this, much of this research comes out of a book of mine from Simon and Schuster. Uh, obviously the title is Hannibal because he's the most famous Carthaginian in history. And I've had a lot of fun researching this book with National Geographic sponsorship funding. Uh, and uh, in the times I've taught this, uh, both at Stanford and elsewhere, have been very both uh, satisfying, revealing, and humbling because Hannibal in some ways is a figure larger than life. I can't begin uh, to fully understand the enigma of a man who won so many battles but ultimately lost the war. His feud with the Romans was because they were trying to destroy Carthage and he was trying to stop them, not by destroying Rome, but by making them back off. And for a while, he was successful. So in this book, uh, particularly the early chapters, I detail uh, much of the material we're going to look at uh, today. But one burning question that I'm often asked is why did Hannibal cross the Alps? In 218 BC, he really didn't have much other choice. And let's explore that because that's part of this story too. Uh, when you look at his family, uh, uh, Phoenician aristocrats in this Punic town, Carthage. Punic is, Punica is the Roman way of saying what used to be Phoenicia, but now it's not 
Phoenicia and Lebanon, it's in what we call today Tunisia on the coast of North Africa. This is a silver coin, uh, a, a coin that was issued by the family of Hannibal. It's either him or his father, Hamilcar, a, a very noted general who fought in the First Punic War. The Second Punic War is often called Hannibal's War, but I don't want to get ahead of myself here, uh, particularly since uh, we see on this silver coin an African elephant with its large ears and a concave back uh, and a different type of cerebrum. Hannibal had both Asian elephants and African elephants. The Carthaginians fought with war elephants, something the Romans never did. In fact, the Romans uh, had to learn how to fight against elephants. But uh, in this question, since it comes up all the time, why did Hannibal cross the Alps? This picture, in a way, begins to explain it all. If we look at Rome, here's Italy. Rome, as a power in the third century BC, uh, is landlocked. Uh, we can see that they're on Italy and they're moving both south and north. They have what they think is a great wall protecting them, the Alps, this barrier, hundreds of miles long, uh, well over uh, when you think about it, uh, much of it way above 6,000 feet. And this chain of mountains runs smack down to the Mediterranean in what we call the Alps Maritime. I was just there three days ago. Uh, I just returned uh, from uh, the French Riviera and the Alps. And this became even more clear uh, as I was preparing for this talk that Ron, that you kindly asked me to do. Uh, now, uh, when we look at the Roman Empire, you can clearly see at its height in the second century AD that it's around the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean, which means sort of in the middle of the earth, in the middle of the world, all of the powers, all the lands that are surrounding the Mediterranean have to be connected by this body of water. So water is the essential medium that begins to uh, put this, this question to a, a, an understandable answer. Yes, the Romans went beyond the Mediterranean, clearly, but that water connection and that victory over water in the Mediterranean is what establishes them as a world power. This is a map uh, of the Mediterranean about the time of the end of the First Punic War. You can see Rome landlocked here on the Italian peninsula. They're moving up into what's called the Transpadana, the Po River Valley, which had been Celtic territory. Uh, and uh, notice the island of Sicily, which is what the First Punic War is all about. The Romans feel that the Carthaginians here are too close to Italy because it's only 100 miles from Cape Bone to Cape Lelebium between the two uh, land bodies. And there's only a three mile jump between Messina uh, and the uh, eastern coast uh, of Sicily and the western coast of the toe of the boot of Italy. The Romans felt under pressure, intimidated, and worried about how close Carthage was. So they did not originally control Sicily. Uh, at the beginning of the First Punic War in 264, Sicily was really belonging to Carthage and its alliances. So they set about trying to change that, to make Sicily theirs. Now, when you think about it, Carthage, which controls the north coast of Africa with all its allies, peoples who are not necessarily Carthaginian, Numidians, Getulans, Libyans, Mauritanians, and of course, across the Straits of Gibraltar, what we, what we then called the Pillars of Heracles or Hercules, the Celt-Iberians here. And they'd established colonies like New Carthage, uh, which we know in Latin uh, uh, as Cartago Nova, but becomes then uh, today Cartagena. That's the same name slightly changed through time. So they began to extract great silver and ore capacities out of Iberia. Iberia named after the then Ebro River, which we, we call Ebro today, but was Iber then. And Rome had its eye on the mineral wealth of Spain, but it had no maritime power. It was not a sea power. When you think about that Rome was, was ar around uh, in a peninsula surrounded by sea, 
They were basically landlocked and they were land lovers. They were not sailors. They were not uh, naval power oriented. The sea power to them was something they did not imagine uh, uh, at the outset of this conflict between Rome and Carthage fighting over supremacy of the Mediterranean. I'll, I could come back to this picture, but since most of the, the first Punic War takes place on and around Sicily, let's take a look that from 264 on, the Romans land at Messina, just across the Straits from Calabria, and they began to push their way across this island. Many battles, they tried to pull in Syracusa, which had been independent. There are many battles uh, with Agrigentum uh, and so on. One, one battle, the Battle of Ecno Ecnomus here in 256, uh, AC means Avante Cristo, before Christ. Uh, that battle was perhaps one of the largest naval battles in history. Hun we, we say hundreds of ships involving over 100,000 both soldiers and sailors. And we could say as many as 800 or more ships involved. So one of the largest battles in history. But most of this war, was a stalemate, back and forth, land and sea. The Romans were better at soldiering and the Carthaginians were better at sailing. So as the context, as this, the conflict moved back and forth on land and sea, it usually was whoever had the upper hand on land would win that battle if it's the Romans or whoever had the upper hand in the sea, often the Carthaginians would win that phase. One particular general, Hannibal's father, Hamilcar, uh, was a better general than most, better than most of the Carthaginians for sure, and probably better than most of the Romans. And he held out against the Romans. The Romans even attacked uh, Africa. They even attacked near Carthage. But it was a seesaw back and forth for 23 years. Essentially a stalemate, huge draining of resources, both human manpower, and of timber and boats and, and economic uh, wherewithal. Uh, so both of these sea uh, and land powers, sea power Carthage, land power Rome, by 23 years on, were fairly bankrupt. Carthage even asked for a loan from the Ptolemies in Egypt of 2,000 talents. They didn't get it, but neither had the wherewithal to finish off the other. So back and forth, back and forth, the battles went. Now, Rome put up a huge propaganda war against Carthage. Uh, Rome really wanted the Carthaginian territory. Rome wanted the control over the water, but had very little experience at shipbuilding. They, they had very few trained sailors. So they were stymied in that process. Now, looking at a satellite image of the same thing, essentially, uh, the bigger picture, uh, Rome uh, ultimately, down the line, would move out of Italy, would conquer the Celts, would conquer the Alps. Augustus put up a, a huge monument above Monaco uh, called the Turbi, La Turbi, where he conquered by essentially 25 BCE, uh, well over 100 different uh, Celtic tribes, and certainly many tribes in the Alps. That was a major, major uh, sort of climatic moment to put that. And you can see it if you're passing by in the water down below the Maritime Alps. If you're passing below Monaco, Monte Carlo area, you can actually see that monument. It's well over 100 feet high up on the mountain. Eventually, Rome would conquer Greece in 146 BCE, basically the same time they conquered Carthage. And eventually, would take over Anatolia, Asia Minor, what we call Turkey today. Uh, even before that, they were conquering Spain. So eventually, Rome added all of the Mediterranean within their power. But it didn't happen overnight. And they had to contend with Carthage to do so. Now, this is a picture I took out of my airplane window flying out of Nice uh, on uh, Thursday just a few days ago, because you can see the mountains just at sunrise when we took off from Nice Airport. We, we see these mountains below us, these ridge after ridge of maritime Alps. 
and I want to get that picture for you, Ron, and for the Yacht Club, because I want to show you why Hannibal couldn't go along the coast, because the mountains plummet to the sea right there. Here's some pictures of this. Hannibal, by 218 BCE, after the First Punic War, could not go across the water because Rome now owns the Med. And he couldn't go along the coast. If you've ever driven along the Corniche uh, in, in your uh, sort of James Bond, Aston Martin, uh, you go through uh, gallery after gallery and tunnel after tunnel because they had to tunnel through the mountains to make modern roads. This is a jagged, rugged coast. Be impossible to send an army along the coast. There's no, there's no stretches wide enough, etc. Can't, can't do it. And the Romans control that narrow strip of land. So the Romans, by the time Hannibal comes along, can't go by sea and he can't go by the coast. So he has to go over the Alps. It's it's a simple question, maybe a somewhat complicated answer, uh, but uh, here, if you look at how the Alps run right down along the border of France and Italy, he's got to get to Italy because the Gauls here, the Celts here, are begging for help. Rome is taking over all their farmland. The Boi tribe of Bononia, which we call Bologna today, they're really encroached upon. They can't even farm because the Romans have set up all these new colonies at uh, Placentia, which is now Piacenza, at Cremonum, which is now Cremona. They're taking over the whole Po River Valley. So they're calling for help. And the only one who answers their plea is Hannibal, because he wants to fulfill his promise to his father to push back against Rome and be their enemy. And he has to cross the Alps in early winter. Not easy. So why did Hannibal cross the Alps? Because he can't go by sea and can't go by the coast. It's very clear. You can see now here, if you're looking between Ventimiglia, Monaco, Nice, the Riviera area, these mountains are jagged. Uh, you just, you, you can't go around the coast. You've got to go through the mountains. And Rome was surprised because they thought their wall, the Alps, protected them. Well, it didn't. Now, let's talk a little bit back about the Phoenicians. On their coins from Tyre and Sidon in Lebanon, they show their mastery over the sea. Here's a Phoenician ship with Phoenician sailors and soldiers. And below that is a hippocamp, meaning a sea monster, uh, part uh, uh, fishy creature and part horse. By the way, seahorses, those little critters are actually uh, very common in these waters, but they're tiny. But the ancient peoples thought they were baby monsters. Well, here's a monster. But the, the point is that the Phoenicians are on top of it. Literally, they're in control of the sea. Now, this is a picture I took crossing the Straits of Messina from basically from Sicily to Italy. The Romans went the opposite way, but it was during a storm and the waters swirl. This is where the famous between a rock and a hard place myth comes from. Uh, the rocks of Italy and the whirlpools as two bodies of water meet. The, the gyres going in opposite directions, the Tyrrhenian Sea and the Ionian Sea create whirlpools. So Scylla and Charybdis, this is the place. So the sea is not easy here. In fact, on the boat, the captain asked me to go back inside because, you know, it really got turbulent out there. Storms are common in the Mediterranean. And this is in March, which is kind of a little bit premature for the sailing season in the ancient world. They really wouldn't go out until about April. So you, you look at these satellite images. Look at how close. This picture right here shows you what I just took. If you look here. Let's go back. Here is Italy, and there's the tip of Sicily right there. It's not even three miles across. That's what the Romans were worried about. So here's the larger picture you see, three miles across right there. The Romans were worried. Carthage is too close. The Roman senators who owned a lot of farmland in Campania around Naples, uh, which was a Greek colony originally, Neapolis means new city, the Romans were worried that Carthage was going to cross from Sicily, which they controlled, and invade Italy. 
Well, the invasion never came from Carthage this way, uh, particularly once the Romans controlled the Med. The invasion came from Hannibal this way, over a mountain barrier the Romans thought was impregnable. Huh. Now, Carthaginian ships, we have them on terracotta reliefs. Uh, uh, we have all kinds of images of ships. The Carthaginians, the Phoenicians, were the best mariners in the ancient world. They sailed around Africa. They sailed uh, to England, to Cornwall. Uh, they uh, had possibly even sailed to the New World across the Atlantic following currents. We can't prove that, but we know the others are true. They went to India. They had an immense trade. And in a previous talk that I did for your series, I explored some of those Phoenician monopolies in timber from the cedars of Lebanon, in opium from the Bacaw Valley of Lebanon, which was the divine gift of pain relief in the ancient world. Uh, they controlled the monopoly in frankincense. They controlled the, the, the monopoly and one of the most important commodities in the world, which was purple dye. They gave purple the color of royalty because they controlled that trade. And in the previous lecture, I showed this little shell. This is a murex shell from the little, the little creature uh, that creates the purple dye with chemicals and red salts. The, the Carthaginian tradition sold the world that this was the luxury color, purple, because of, because of the dye from this little shell. This one I found, and I talked about that in a previous lecture. I'll just iterate a bit of it. The Carthaginians, the Phoenicians were brilliant. They were the mercantile trade geniuses of the ancient world. Rome wanted in on the action. To do so, they have to beat the Carthaginians at their own game. They got to win the sea. And they don't know how. They're land lovers. Now, you look at Carthaginian ships, the biremes, you know, ships from about 75 feet long uh, with sails up to 200 feet long, uh, sometimes carrying goods, sometimes transport, sometimes soldiers or uh, with the sailors. But they wrote the book on ancient sailing. Hanno the Navigator and others, they were great maritime explorers and they sailed by day and they sailed by night. They could track the stars. They were really good. They weren't afraid of open water. They were the only people in the ancient world who crossed open water and did not hug the coast. As far as we know, they were the only ones who could sail away from land and not be afraid. Uh, this is a reconstruction of a Carthaginian boat. You can see whether it's three rows of oars, a trireme, or two rows of oars, a bireme, or a, a five rows of oars, that gives you uh, enormous uh, maneuverability as long when you take your sails down, you depend upon the oars. So they had some pretty big ships. They had lots of ships. Now, the only problem that Carthage had was they had the Atlas Mountains for timber. That's basically Morocco, et cetera, today, Tunisia, Morocco, Martin. But the Atlas Mountains were never that forested in history. They're always have been on the edge of the Sahara. So they were lacking timber resources. That didn't stop them because they traded timber. Some of their original timber, remember, was the cedars of Lebanon, all the way back on the east side of the Mediterranean. They knew how to work wood. They knew how to build ships. So when we look at their harbor, this was a double harbor in Carthage. It was both a mercantile harbor and a military harbor. It had both sides. And it was called a secret harbor because you couldn't see it from the water. It was blocked uh, by a gate. And you, there was no way you knew it was inside unless you'd been there. Uh, and it had a chain across it to keep boats from coming in sneak attacks. And right here uh, in you know, a, 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 more than a decade ago, this is where I found this little shell, this purple dye <laughs> shell. So, uh, I was really lucky and I got permission to keep it uh, as a, a sort of a, a, a storytelling device. Now here, I took this picture from the top of the hill of Carthage, the Bursa Hill. And if you look in the picture, you can just see out here, there's the, the circle of that secret harbor. That's all that's left. You see it? That's it. Now it's surrounded by wealthy villas. Now the Romans tried to figure out any way they could 
to beat Carthage at its own game. And it's not going to be easy. So they built up this propaganda against Carthaginian religion, among other things. I know this bit is a bit uh, controversial. It's very contentious. This is a cemetery, but it's a child cemetery. And it's filled with burned children's bones. There are 700 of these grave markers. Underneath them are seven centuries of clay, uh, amphora, and pottery with burnt children's bones, basically under five or six years old. And the children did not die in an epidemic. This was not high infant mortality because mixed in with the children's bones are little animal bones like birds and others. They were offerings. Rome took full advantage that the Carthaginians apparently practiced some force, some side, some idea of infant or child sacrifice. There are huge arguments about this in the academic world. Was it normative behavior or was it one-off? Was it once in a while? It's really hard to say, but Rome knew about this. And Diodorus Siculus, a historian, says that sometimes the, the Carthaginians were so afraid of the future, they sacrificed hundreds of children at one time. So authors like Diodorus Siculus and the biblical records, also the books of the Bible talk about this, that these people practiced child sacrifice. And the Romans were, they were really, really strong about saying this was bad to do. We would agree. We just don't know how much the Carthaginians did it, but the Romans took full advantage of that as a propagandistic tool because they said, this, this country, this people has to go. Their, their morals are abhorrent. Who would sacrifice children to their gods? Uh, this is a picture I took in the cemetery. You can see, uh, and by the way, do you see the wall at the end of this picture? That's a villa at the end of that wall. And the excavators, Larry Stagger from the Semitic uh, Museum at, at Harvard and Sam Wolf, who visited me in London, Sam told me in London, look, we couldn't excavate any further because there's a villa there and it's private property. He said, we found 3,000 of these urns of children's bones. And we only excavated a tenth of this cemetery. 3,000 times 10, there's a lot of children buried there. And as I said, there's no evidence whatsoever in the bone fragments that have survived. There's no suggestion that there's been any kind of pathological or pathogen or these were, these did not die, these children of natural causes, they were sacrificed. And when you go to the Carthage Barter Museum, you can see some of these stelae show men and women bringing children to the gods in their arms, bringing them as sacrificial victims. It, it says consort of Baal. Is that how you pronounce it, Baal? Ba Baal, uh, Baal, yeah. Is, is Baal, is that the same as the uh, part inside the Bible where Moses is crossing in the desert and he is, he finds when he goes up on the mound that when he returns, many of his followers have begun to worship the golden calf of Baal. Is that the same Baal? Well, that's a really good point, Ron, and what a good memory you have. Now, Baal in Semitic languages, in Hebrew as well as Phoenician, they're cognate cousin languages. So if you are a Phoenician from Tyre, like King Hiram, and if you're an Israelite from Jerusalem, you basically understand each other. It's not too different from me going to South Carolina and, and understanding somebody who speaks a sort of an Appalachian dialect uh, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. They can understand each other. And Baal means Lord in both Phoenician and Hebrew. So they're, they're similar languages. Now, it's true that El, the primary father god of Baal, is a bull. So maybe there's a connection to that god, although many scholars think it was kind of a borrowed Egyptian apis bull because they just left Egypt. Whatever the case, uh, bull worship is pretty common also in the ancient world, particularly Bronze Age. Now, if we look close up at some of these stelae, these, these burial markers, think of them as gravestones. Uh, this is called a tophet. 
Now, Tophet is a cemetery, but it's a cemetery uh, in Hebrew as well as in uh, the cognate Phoenician language. And it's also close to the Indo-European word that we have for a grave in Greek, taphos. Taphos is a grave. So if you have something written on a grave, it's an epitaphos. It's an epitaph. So same root word. It's a gravestone. Uh, in archaeology, we have a whole study of grave goods called taphonomics, meaning what we find in graves. Now, we're getting towards Halloween, but I'm not very macabre, so I'm not going to go there. <laughs> but, you know, I walk around my neighborhood and boy, everybody's got gravestones and skeletons all over their yards. So, you know, Halloween is the time to think about this, maybe. <laughs> now, look at this gravestone. Uh, you see a triangular motif. It's a woman in a dress. That's the goddess Tanit. She's the consort of Baal. Uh, uh, you, you know, you could go on about this. There it is. Do you see the, the, the symbol here? That is Tanit. So these are children sacrificed to Baal or better to his consort Tanit. So the Romans, wow, they really made a lot of this. Now remember, Hannibal's name means the favored one of Baal. Hani Baal. Han means favor, Baal. So he's either Baal's favorite, and that's the god he sacrificed to, to go with his father to Spain, to Iberia, to promise that he would hate Rome. There's a lot tied up in here, but I don't want to uh, go into too much detail. Uh, I've covered this in my book, uh, and uh, if you want more details, you know, you can find them there. But these are the pictures to go along with the book. But wait, Patrick, you said in your book, yeah. You have many books. I, last count, I think you had 18. How many do you have now? 25. <laughs> <laughs> Which book? Would we... <laughs> oh, that one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a great book. Exactly. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, when you look at Roman ships, what people don't often realize is because the Romans were not innovators, they were assimilators. They borrowed and copied. So you look at Roman ships, what you're looking at, are the two colored pictures on the left and on the top, these are borrowed from Carthaginian models or Greek models, but more likely Carthaginian models because the Carthaginians were so successful. Now, originally in sea battles, they had these battering rams called a rostrum, and they battered each other with these bronze and others to break through the hull at the bow and sink the ship. But that required maneuverability, and the Romans didn't have that. They had other things they did, too. They actually created in this First Punic War something called a corvus. It's a boarding ladder. So you'd come up to a ship. This would drop down. It's basically, you can see it's kind of a balustrade. A back. It's, a, it's a ramp that then the other soldiers can run across from their ship and board the other ship. And you can also see a battering ram in front, a rostrum. They actually had to abandon this, too. Uh, both the battering rams and the, bo the boarding ladder, uh, they, they weren't maneuverable enough yet to work these things out. Here's, here's that Phoenician ship again that I showed you, or Punic ship from Carthage. And they were big enough to hold whole, not, you know, not battalions, but a phalanx, a fighting group of soldiers, as well as the sailors who actually sailed the ship. How many, well, how many soldiers or sailors? It depends on the size of the ship, whether it's a bireme, trireme, quinquireme, or whatever. How many rows of oars? Two rows, three rows, five rows. So the bigger ships can carry more, both sailors, to maneuver the ship, run the sails, row the, uh, the oars, and so on. Is it 50 to 300? What's, what's the number? I would say 200 is probably about the maximum. Uh -huh. 200 people. Mm -hmm. Now, when we look at Roman ships, this is a, a double graph. Most Roman ship hulls are made of oak. And then the lighter woods, the conifers, pine, fir, and cypress, those are the masts and the upper, the inside parts, but the outer parts are almost always oak. And you can see a distribution of the kinds of trees used. Uh, oak, look at the, the top row there on the left. Oak is the big contributor to wood, but you have to have oak forests. Uh, so you know, oaks survive better uh, underwater. Uh, the softer woods don't. Uh, now, 
Fortunately, what Italy have it has in its favor in the ancient world that the Carthaginians didn't have, Italy was immensely forested. And you can just see here some of the forests uh, in Italy that the Romans eventually began to use, particularly toward the end of the First Punic War, with all this back and forth, ebb and flow, uh, and the stalemate, Rome needed more boats. Sometimes in a battle, they might, they might have a thousand ships, they lose them all. But that also happened at times at Carthage. But Carthage were, the Carthaginians were better at maneuvering in all kinds of weather, usually, and they had more ships and better ships. So the Romans had to copy this Phoenician or Carthaginian boat type twice. Now, you can just see uh, in some of these images, these are some boats off Napoli that are now in a museum and they've pres been preserved in, in laboratories. You can see the, the hull is oak and mostly it's the oak that has survived. So we have a lot of Roman shipwrecks that we can now compare, but we see the evolution of the Roman ship. This is one of the biggest Roman ships ever found in Lake Nemi. It was found in Lake Nemi, one of the biggest, look at this boat, this was hundreds of feet long. And it was basically for the Roman emperor Caligula, he had big parties, this is a party boat. And it was sunk in Lake Nemi, south of Rome, and then dredged up as you can see here. But mostly oak, as far as we know. But again, the Romans were in a learning process. This boat is from basically a, about 35 to 40 AD. This is the end. This is the evolutionary end of when they understand boat construction. And by the way, this isn't really a sailing boat because Lake Nemi is a tiny little lake that you row across. Now let's get back to one of these surprises. How did the Romans do it? There were two main events. And if you've ever been uh, off Trapani, Western Sicily, I took this picture coming down the funicular to get the water and the Agates Islands. They called this place ancient Draponum. And it was first Carthaginian owned and controlled. But in 241, in the last gasp of this war, the stalemate when both countries, Rome and Carthage, were pretty much bankrupt, Rome had a basic good turn of luck that changed the tide of war. Uh, the, the Phoenicians had a fleet of ships off the Aegeides Islands that you see here to the west, and a storm caught them. And they were undermanned, and they were too heavy. They were bringing supplies, and the, the Carthaginians lost their entire fleet. Now, what had happened before, the Romans had found a Carthaginian ship they dredged it up and they found to their surprise, because they weren't master boat builders, they were copyists. To their great luck, they found this boat, every single ship timber was stamped. It had an alphanumeric uh, letter number code. It was like paint by numbers. These boats were mass produced. And once they got the template, the Romans could mass produce ships like the Carthaginians, but it took them a long time. This was a huge turn of events, plus the sinking of that fleet, as I said, off ancient Draponum, Draponi. They also found another boat that had been a blockade runner. They got that boat, they took it apart, put it back together, took it apart, and then mass produced it. This is what changed the war for the Romans. They beat the Carthaginians by luck, uh, by storm, by the sinking of the Carthaginian fleet. They copied the Carthaginian models using those templates. That changed history. This is my photo when I was off the Agedis Islands. And you can see here, uh, there's one of the main uh, Agedis Islands. That storm caught the Carthaginians by surprise. They lost their entire fleet. They had nothing left. The Roman fleet was not caught in this storm. They'd been in safe harbor. And boom, the war is over. The Carthaginians sue for peace. The Romans say, yes, but not so quickly. You pay us back several thousand talents of silver. 
that treaty of 241, and Hamilcar, Hannibal's father, was still stuck on Sicily with an army. He was really mad. He didn't want Carthage to concede, but they had no navy left except for their mercantile navy, the commercial navy. They had no war boats left. That changed history. Now, down the line, after Hannibal invades Italy by the Alps, Cato stands up in the Roman Senate and he wants Carthage destroyed. This is now uh, about 146 BCE, 150 to 146 BCE. And he basically says in the Roman Senate, something like Cartago de Lenda Est. It's probably slightly different. It might be de Lendula Est, but he says something that Carthage must be destroyed. And to make his point, he picks up on the rostrum, that's the speakers, he, uh, uh, a sort of uh, lectern, he picks up a ripe fig. It probably came from his own farm in Italy. But he says this fig came from Carthage. <laughs> and he says, look at how fresh it is. That's how close they are to us, three days away. He's trying to scare the Romans into saying, Carthage must be destroyed because this fig, this ripe fig, says they're that close, too close for comfort. The Romans have copied Carthaginian ship templates. They have learned in the space of 23 years how to sail them, how to man them, how to maneuver them. And basically, history moves from Carthaginian sea dominance to Roman sea dominance. This is the start of the Roman Empire. The Romans took each surrounding area like dominoes falling because they now controlled the Mediterranean. And as they said, what was Carthage's is now our sea. <laughs> what a fascinating presentation. So a few questions. As I recall, Phoenician sea power was really strong in the beginning of Greece's ascent. And in those days, the Phoenicians were in the Eastern Mediterranean. Right. And then they migrated, yes, exactly. And they migrated westward to Carthage. Why did they migrate westward? And why did their Western sort of outpost become so superior to their legacy Eastern roots? The Assyrians came. The Assyrians came in the 10th century and basically uh, conquered Tyre. So they had to move west. Plus, they want oh. to control the trade to the west. They have to get their tin, you see, from all the way up here. Okay. So they have to go outside the Mediterranean to do that. Okay. Uh, and they, the, the Carthaginians control the southern Mediterranean. The Greeks control the northern Mediterranean. Thank you. I, I had to ask that question. So how would you compare ships of ancient Greece to the ships of Carthage? Generally smaller. Okay. The Carthaginians were smaller or the Greeks were? Greeks were. And, and remember, there's no place in Greece where you're more than 50 miles from the sea. It's easier to go around Greece by sea than over land. But it's so many bays and inlets and tiny little uh, places you can't get a big ship in. In general, the Greek ships were smaller, meaning generally more maneuverable, but the Greeks weren't so open water crossing like the Phoenicians. So uh, Greek sea power, sure, the Greeks colonized all of South Italy and Sicily, but they did it in competition with the Carthaginians. Sicily was the key to the Mediterranean. Whoever controlled Sicily would control the Mediterranean. That's why the Romans took it from Carthage in 241 in that 23-year war. Look at how central Sicily is. Sicily has been the crossing point of history by so many peoples. So uh, Carthage controlled it. Now it belongs to Rome. So now you mentioned that the, the Romans used a propaganda theme of child sacrifice, infant sacrifice. Uh, in their propaganda war, what was the media they used to communicate to populations uh, the bad imagery that they had were trying to popularize in their propaganda war? They used everything at their disposal. Uh, they had public orators. Uh, they wrote on wax tablets. They wrote on stone. They wrote on papyrus. Uh, they 
made proclamations that went throughout the entire uh, Roman territories. They were incessant, hammering at this theme, how immoral the Carthaginians are. Basically, they just wanted their trade dominance. And so was there within the um, leadership of Rome, were there specific um, communication people? I mean, did they have people who were identified as communication folks who could help propagate the propaganda war? Roman writers, uh, and of course, uh, the senators themselves who were usually illiterate, they could read and write. And then there, there's a whole uh, a hierarchy of Roman officials who uh, are involved in this communication. So when Hannibal goes north across what is now the eastern shore of Spain and he's heading toward the Alps, wouldn't the scouts or other folks in the colon, in the Roman colonies there be able to give Rome uh, word in weeks and months in advance that the, that the Carthaginians are coming with their army and including their elephants? Yeah, they did. And in fact, one primary Roman colony, which we now call Marseille, was Massilia, right here. And they also controlled this eastern part of Gaul, which they would try to block Hannibal too. So uh, the Romans sent legions over to try to find Hannibal before he came to Italy, before he invaded. But it was, it was, you know, late fall and Hannibal disappears. And what they don't realize, he goes north to cross the Alps. Uh, so total surprise to the Romans. Oh, I get it. So in other words, they're expecting he's going to try to come along the coast. They get prepared to defend that. And then his surprise mood is to do what nobody thought was feasible, which is to go over the Alps. Yes. So it, it, though we consider Hannibal to be this incredible master of strategy, you know, historically powerful war figure, was his move to go north across the Alps strategic blunder? No, uh, it's a good point because, you know, he lost a lot of men and soldiers in the winter over the Alps and he was ambushed twice by the Gauls or Celts, but he still invaded Italy successfully. And then in three decisive battles at Trebia, Trasimene and Cannae, destroyed over 100,000 Romans in a period of three years. 100,000 of a population of what? Well, it's hard to say exactly, uh, but, you know, we're talking about a population of 100,000 soldiers between the fighting ages of roughly 18 to 50, the Romans could keep levying conscripts to bring farm boys into the war, but not necessarily very well trained. And Hannibal took advantage of that too. But Rome had endless manpower, had endless fertility of land, and had all these this timber, all these forests. So ultimately, Hannibal's invasion is going to be futile. Hannibal has to go through the colonies in Bologna and North Italy, many of which wish to rebel from Roman taxation, et cetera. How is it they're able to, how, how are the Romans able to hold the loyalty of those colonies so they didn't join Hannibal and attack southerly? Many of them did join Hannibal. Uh, and that was, uh, that was Hannibal's, his goal, his aim was to isolate Rome and take away the southern Greek uh, established colonies and take away the northern colonies. And he almost won. He almost did it. So two millennia after uh, Hannibal's ultimate defeat, what do military strategists now say would have been a better approach to attacking Rome. Are they su suggesting it should have been better to take Sicily, which was closer to Carthage? What did they say Hannibal did wrong? It's a conundrum. Uh, his strategies for individual battles are taught in every mil military academy uh, pretty much in the world. Sometimes I lecture on Hannibal at the US Naval War College. They want to hear it. My book, this is a little you know, curious, my book on Hannibal is in St. Petersburg at the Russian Naval Academy Library. <laughs> in summary, uh, how was it that Rome first conquered the Med, or how important was it for them to conquer the Med before they could conquer the known world at that time? Great question. The Romans had to get through Carthage to conquer the Med. And they were transformed from a nation of landlocked landlubbers to shipbuilders and sailors because they copycatted Carthage's successes. 
by using Carthaginian ship templates, the Romans became the masters of the Mediterranean and then the world. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge, wisdom, insight with the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thanks, thank man. you, Ron, and thank you, the St. Francis Yacht Club. Thanks, man.